Is that good? Is that about the sort of thing that we're looking for? I think if we're looking for wisdom about how to be engaged politically as Christians in our late modern context, we could do no better than go back to the fifth century. <laughs> I, I, I am convinced, and this is my work for the next couple of years, that St. Augustine's City of God is um, an unbelievably rich resource for us thinking through our postmodern context. And here's why. Well, for a lot of reasons, but at least this. I mean, w some of us might not realize how pluralist and fragilized <laughs> uh, Augustine's context was. We, we tend to imagine Augustine as a medieval theologian. He's not. He's writing in late antiquity. He's not writing, I mean, we, and we also imagine that he's writing from this sort of, you know, uniform, uh, uh, um, homogenous, and hegemonic Christendom. He's not. He's, he's writing the city of God in a very fraught context where people are saying that Christians are to blame for the fall of the empire and all of these kinds of things. And, and he, he does two things, I think, in the city of God that are really important. One is he is actually trying to get Christians to stop over-identifying the city of God with earthly empires. So he, he's actually, it's actually a sifting process because some people, including folks like Jerome, seem to have thought that the, because the city of God and Rome were almost identified, when Rome falls, it's like, oh my gosh, the city of God is falling. And Augustine kind of writes the city of God and makes this distinction to remind them, no, 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 we are citizens of a heavenly city and uh, that city finds its political instantiation in the church, which is the body of Christ. So we kind of shouldn't be surprised that earthly empires fall. You know, that's not, stop over-identifying. Very relevant message for today. But at the same time, he says, um, you seek the welfare of the city. You know, that sort of, uh, uh, um, we don't give up on being a, an influence for the common good. And for Augustine, that's because the Christian faith comes with a robust vision of what God wants for the whole world. You know, it's not just a escape plan for souls. It is a, a vision of shalom and flourishing for every sphere of creation. So he says we have something to say about that, and, and the church should be that kind of leavening influence. So um, I, I would say that has come to me as a challenge as somebody who kind of worked through a certain um, Howard Wassian moment where I think someone like Howard Wass gets you that very, very important distinction between the city of God and earthly empires, right? That's, that's kind of, and that's really sort of therapeutic to work through that. But then what Augustine gives you is also a theology of creation that helps us to understand how and why Christians should be contributing culture making that leads, contributes to the flourishing of creation and, and to the cities of which we are a part. And the fun thing with Augustine too is you can see this in his sermons. So it, of course you have big magisterial works like the city of God, but if you ever get a chance to pour through his sermons or his letters, um, he's functioning, he is functioning politically. He's appealing to princes, he's appealing to governors rather, and, and asking them to exercise mercy in how they administer the death penalty. He's, he's intervening in conflicts, seeking peace. Um, you, you see a model of an engaged Christian leader um, who, who both has a strong sense that the center of gravity of our political identity is the body of Christ, but then that sort of spills over into a concern for the common good, um, even with those who are not members of that city of God. Um, I, I think it's a really, really rich resource.